listening to Bleeding Page Podcast. Join authors Chad Lutsky and Jason Brandt as they delve into writing and publishing the dark side of fiction. Welcome to episode four of the Bleeding Page Horror Podcast. This week we are talking to Sadie Hartman, otherwise known as Mother Horror, everywhere online. She reviews a ton of books and is the, I guess, co-creator, co-owner of Nightworms, Mm -hmm. the outstanding subscription company for horror novels and all kinds of other goodies. And I think it's going to be a good one, Chad. I think everybody's going to like it. Yeah, I think so too. She, uh, instead of like giving us information as far as like marketing and things like that, she has a different perspective and gives insight on maybe what readers and or reviewers are looking for, as well as, um, you know, kind of lots of, you know, behind the scenes info on Nightworms and everything that goes into it. And uh, we get into kind of call her the horror entrepreneur. Yeah. And that's a good description. He, he's made, or she's made a, a really good platform for herself over the years in um, accidentally, it sounds like kind of not necessarily something that she actively was pursuing, but just started snowballing and this is what it is now. And, and um, yeah, so it's different, a different type of insight. Yeah. It's impressive that she's able to do what she does full time in in a genre as small sure. as horror and she doesn't write horror fiction she just reviews it and then yeah. has kind of a book subscription service and she's able to do it full time it's very impressive yeah yeah and and she's followed by Stephen King on Twitter who follows that, about 130 people yeah so, blew my mind when she said about woman. him retweeting her i was like what yeah that's pretty cool yeah that's pretty amazing so i i i had a question i wanted to ask you before we get into the interview um in the last episode we were talking to dan patavana um so have you been questioning which area you want to invest your time in between your youtube channel and so bad it's good because i know you've been putting all your time into so bad it's good yeah um in in becoming you know the rock star that's signing breasts um, on the street and stuff like that (laughs) still waiting on that first one but i feel like it's gonna happen soon (laughs) i think it is (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, people stopping you in the street asking for your photo. Um, or I mean, talking to Dan, has it has it has made you like at least question should I be spending more time on like I mean, Dan was making a ton of money. You're um, writing in a series. It makes me want to get back into my writing business more, but I knew when I started really pushing on YouTube, I'm gonna take several months here. I'm just gonna grind on this because I wanna have two concurring businesses. I want to have my writing business and then I want to have my YouTube business Mm -hmm. and I want them to run simultaneously. But in building the YouTube one from the ground up, I knew it was going to take up all my writing time for a couple of months here. Fortunately, after the end of this week, maybe next week, uh, I will be where I want to be. I'll be caught up on uh, all the work and on all the setup for the account and everything I'm doing. So after next week, hopefully I'll be able to it starts spending 50% of my time on my writing business again. So did it make me reconsider that? No. Did it really get me itching to jump back into writing and, and producing and selling my books again? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, I think we're in the magical time to be a writer, to just be able to say, Oh, you know, this horror thing, mm, I'm going to try some thrillers. And then all of a sudden you're making quarter of a million dollars a year and killing it on his level. It's just uh, it's a great story. And it's got me excited to get back into it. For sure. And for those who don't know about J- uh, Jason's YouTube channel, uh, you know, in the search bar, or whatever, either type Jason Brandt or uh, So Bad It's Good. And dude, you've got, I'm like, you know, I, I told you I've been watching like some of the older videos and looking forward to the ones, uh, and I watch them during lunch, looking forward to the ones uh, that come out every Sunday. And dude, you have like a cult over there, man. I, 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 I see, I could tell that, some a lot of the people that are commenting are are regulars. Yeah, and there's like something that they're really looking up to. When I see how many numbers you're bringing in, like views, I cannot believe it, dude. It's it's pretty crazy, and it's not you know some huge amount, but I can guarantee now I'll get thirty thousand views in the first week, week to ten days, which considering where it was three months ago is a massive upswing. Yeah, and do you see that consistently going up every every week? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It 
my YouTube was really pushing me through November and December, and that has now stopped. But my numbers are now so much higher. My new plateau is is significantly higher than it was. And you know, now I'm starting to do. Uh, I'm getting hooked up with a sponsorship company. I'm negotiating with now, nice. and pe- I'm at the point where companies want to send me product to, like beer to drink on the show or movies. Wow! So it's it's becoming something. So hopefully I can get some like free shirts or something to wear. So uh, you will be signing breasts soon. It sounds like I I wasn't joking. That's the goal. I don't know if my wife's gonna like it, but uh, I figure once you start signing breasts, that's when you've made it. Wow. Well, thank you, Steven Seagal. <laughs> yeah, the guys <laughs> paid my mortgage a couple times now. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, so yeah, check out this channel. And I don't think that I mentioned it last week. If I did, whatever. Here it is again. I have a book, new book out, Cannibal Creator. Um, it's my homage to 70s and 80s Italian cannibal films. It uh, If you're watching on YouTube, I'm showing the cover. And it's supposed to look like a... That's a great cover. VHS tape. This is the the art copy, so it's got this watermark on it or whatever. Um, It's not extreme horror, but it is more graphic than what I usually do, with the exception of some nasty short stories I've I've, uh, had published. But yeah, it's um, more splatterpunk type of stuff, and it's got got killing in it, and uh, (laughs) it's graphic, (laughs) and it's got cannibalism in it, but but, but with a twist. It's not your average, like... um, just like I've got these people here to die and let's see how they die. It's, it's got, it's much more than that. So it's on Amazon, go grab a copy and I'm doing a giveaway. But by the time I get to that giveaway or by the time you get to this episode, then the giveaway will be over. So congratulations to whoever won the awesome barbecue apron, (laughs) but that's all I have, man. Um, Unless you've got anything else. Nope. That's it. I don't have any news to announce yet, but hopefully here shortly. Well, let's get to our uh, interview with Ms. Sadie Hartman, a.k.a. Mother Horror. Get a lot ready today? Yes. So, Sadie, um, I, I wanted to ask you about, yeah, I was talking to Jason earlier, and I called you like a horror entrepreneur. And do, do you ever think of those words when you think about what you've been doing for the last you know, three or four years. I will say that I have always been entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I was just telling a friend this morning, we were talking about business stuff. And I said, I was stealing vegetables out of my garden, my mom and dad's garden and like selling it on the street corner for like (laughs) nickels so that I could buy candy. Like, and, and it's just like, I, if I, if I didn't like my mom and my mom's lunch that she made me at school, I would like trade stuff and, and do things so that I could have pocket change so I could buy myself like little indulgences, like, you know, a bagel and cream cheese at school or a cup of noodle soup or something. Like I always had money. You know, I bought my own car, my husband and I, we bought our own house, like just always entrepreneurial watching Shark Tank since its inception, um, wanting the American dream of owning my own business. And then the horror, though, the horror scene has been like an evolution for me. So I didn't jump into horror expecting anything out of it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, things would just happen to me. Um, A lot of opportunities landed in my lap from just being a part of a community. So So yeah, entrepreneurial, but like not going into horror with that expectation. Right. Yeah. So you're just like, I want to mingle with other people and read horror and see, you know, start checking out horror books. And then, um, yeah, I I mean, I've watched you. I've known you for maybe three or four years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've watched, I mean, you were doing it at the time. Nightworms really wasn't around, and then and then you started. Nightworms was basically just the title of your um, reviewing group. Yeah, the book club. Yeah. yeah. And then um, then you started doing the you know about what it, those first couple Nightworms packages. And for those who don't know, you have a monthly. Um, are you still not calling it a subscription? No, it's definitely a subscription based okay. company. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's monthly horror. Yeah. Monthly. Yeah, full of. Um, uh, two or three books and, and a lot of them signed 
and uh, mm -hmm. stickers, magnets, tea, bookmarks, things that don't clutter your shelves. Right. Um, that have to do with reading, which is very cool. And um, I, yeah, those first couple, you just were sending out like what, 100 boxes or something like that. Yeah, we capped it at 100. Yeah. yeah. And now you're, are you still under, just under 1,000? No, we, no, we, we don't really talk about the exact okay. number, but it's around that neighborhood. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's a lot. That's very cool. Yeah. It's That's a cool. lot. <laughs> How many of you work on this? So Ashley and I do everything ourselves. We wear all the hats, um, but on the really important days of packing. So packing the goodie bags and packing the packages. Um, I employ um, my daughter and her best friend and Ashley's mom helps us. Um, so we have like a little crew of people that, you know, we just have them here for like the two days that we're packing basically. Um, but everything else is just Ashley and I. That That's a lot of work for two people. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah. I, I think that for most people, unless they've seen your garage and then now you're, you still have like a, a rental space, don't you? Now that you are storing this stuff in, or like, a yeah, it's, it's actually so. We bought this house with the idea that we were going to do an Airbnb or a rental situation here. Um, and then really quickly, we realized that renting to the same person wasn't really ideal for, for our situation. So we thought, well, let's do Airbnb. So we did Airbnb for a while and we just took it off because our last guests were horrible and we hated oh. it. We hated it. It's so stressful, so much anxiety. Like if anyone's thinking about going into the Airbnb space, like make sure it's an off site, like off location, like not in your house kind of situation. Mm -hmm. If you at all, like don't want to deal with a lot of stuff because there's a lot of stuff we dealt with in the few months we, I mean, we were going gangbusters. Like it paid for our Christmas in December. So, I mean, it was, Wow. It was a great situation mm -hmm. in that sense, but it's not worth the stress. Um, and Nightworms rents the back room. Um, so we store a lot of things in there and we pack in there. Um, but we're not gonna we're not gonna do anything with this space for a while. I just can't handle it. I can't handle strangers in my house. I can understand that. I, I don't like strangers being within five hundred feet of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I I should have known. You were yeah. saying you're getting a uh, book delivery today and uh -huh. it's going to be boxes and boxes of books. And then you're getting a crate of more books, I'm assuming. Yes. Or a pallet or something or whatever it was. Yeah. So I guess that's something I that had not really occurred to me. You have a ton of inventory sitting around any given month that you have to deal with. Yeah. I mean, so for each package, like Chad said, we have like two, sometimes even three books. And then the quantity of that we said was somewhere around a thousand. Mm -hmm. um, so for each book, you know, that's maybe 900 or a thousand per. And then, you know, so that's like 3000 books in their boxes, the hard covers, sometimes they can only squeeze like 12 in a box. So there's just a lot of boxes. And I have like a slopey driveway that goes into my garage. And they leave the pallet up at the top because the pallet jacks don't want to come down the mm -hmm. hill with the person holding it because they've tried that before. And I thought I was going to have an insurance nightmare on my hands. So they just drop it at the top. And then I usually am the only one here during the day. And I just dolly that shit back and forth. So, wow. Yeah. So you work out while you're doing it. Yeah. That. That's my workout. <laughs> my mailman is a hero. Like, he loves his job. He's like ex-military. He's super efficient. He brings us these mail bins, about 80 of them in these stacks. I don't know if you know what the mail bins look like, but they're these like transparent. Pumps, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So he brings us like 80 of those in like big stacks. And then when we're filling up all of the USPS mailers with the package, all of those go stacked into each little bin. And then we usually have 80 bins filled with, you know, 10 or 15 packages each. And we got to schlep those back and forth to, to his mail truck. So wow. it takes two now. <laughs> it takes two mail trucks. I, I, I don't, I, what I was 
getting to earlier was that I don't, I'm not sure a lot of people really truly understand all the work that goes into that. Even when you post the pictures, it's like, it's like uh, seeing the picture of like a mountain range, but you have never <laughs> seen one in real life. And then when you it's go not... there, and then when you go there, it's like, you know, that's kind of what my experience was anyway. The first time I saw mountains when I was younger, it's like, I'd seen pictures, you know, my whole life. And then I finally see it in real life. And it was like, wow, that really puts things into perspective. And I would imagine yeah. standing among all that stuff, um, all those, you know, thousands of books and everything that would, uh, that's a lot, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is a lot. Um, and, Especially and for two people. Yeah. And we, we really have divided the workload among the two of us like really well, because while I'm sitting here stickering um, all the envelopes, the black envelopes with our logo sticker, like she also has the label printer at her house. So she's printing all those labels and has to affix them to the USPS mailers. Mm -hmm. And then we come together um, and Ashley, you know, is sitting there filling up the table because as fast as we're packing is as fast as we have to go get more books. And so we bring those to the table, we pack, she goes get and goes and gets more, breaks down the boxes. Like we have a tower of cardboard, you know, by the end. So yeah, it's fun though. I love it. How do you go about deciding what books are going to go into it? It's really a weird process because Indie horror isn't as, um, they don't know as far in advance what their catalog is going to look like and when everything is going to drop. So it's really hard, actually. We can get what the major publishers are pretty good about, like six months to nine months out, they kind of know. Um, and so we can kind of follow some some of those books around and know when what package we can put them into. Um, but we do have to leave empty spaces for our indie friends um, and our favorites. Um, so that's a little bit harder. And then her and I kind of get into these, like we'll sometimes build a package around the books that we want to use. And sometimes we want a theme and put books into the theme. Um, and then her and I just kind of have to like duke it out sometimes <laughs> over what's going to get in there. Okay. And we, I mean, we're a pre-order subscription company, so we're already into June of this year done planned. Um, wow. We have, yeah. I mean, we're, we're launching the March pre-order really soon. So we have to know like way in advance what we're going to put in there. So even any indie authors who wanted to work with you, they have to know what they've got coming down the pipeline yes. way in advance, way in advance because we do the signed book plates. We have to schedule the, 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 um, delivery, um, these books that are coming to us late right now had just like issues from the get go um, because they had a warehouse COVID outbreak. They had all kinds of weird stuff going on. So these books are late, but generally they're coming to us a month in advance. And sometimes we're storing two months together in my garage. <laughs> so are you the only person in your family who's into the horror scene? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, oh, so my, mo my mom, but like in my household, yeah, I'm the only reader. <laughs> so this just annoys everyone else. Yeah, totally. I get mail every day, you know, so as exciting that would be to get packages on your door stuff. Like my husband's always like here, you know, it's a rectangle. <laughs> that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, do you have uh, any expansion plans beyond your somewhere in the 900 to 1000 range? Or do you want to keep it as a kind of small exclusive Mm. situation. Yeah. Ashley and I revisit that conversation quite a bit. Um, I would love to keep scaling and just keep adding more help when we need it. Um, but Ashley really does just want to keep it to this size for now um, because it's manageable. We have total control over all of the quality. We touch or see every single book that goes into a package. Whereas if we were to use like a fulfillment center, um, we wouldn't see that at all. And we wouldn't know what was going into the package or how it was going in there. If things were getting left out, um, you know, it, it's quite an issue when somebody didn't get a bookmark and wants just a bookmark, you know, like, Oh, I didn't get that in my package and we got to send a replacement. So Ashley and I are very serious about making sure every package is exactly right. right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. 
Um, what about, uh, you know, I, I think it was even as far back as a couple of years ago, I was pushing for you guys to do a podcast or at least a YouTube channel and stuff. And, and you do have your YouTube channel that you, that you do like your, at least your annual um, celebrate horror thing. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, have you, have you ever had discussions, even, even just hypothetically or like kind of dreaming big where it's like, what if we had our own, um, like publishing thing, you know, small press or, you know, you had to have talked about, you know, because to go from reviewing books to like doing all this other stuff and seeing the success of, uh, the Nightworms package and then having your, um, your foot in so many different doors it had to have seems like it would have to at least the small press thing would have to come up in conversation at some point so it has it has have you entertained that farther than just discussion Mm. or yeah not really um just having been really closely connected to a lot of different publishers and and um you know ashley and i are editing an anthology with uh, dark matter magazine Mm -hmm. um That is really fun. I love getting that close to doing a publishing situation, but to actually be the publisher and to bankroll everything that I know. I get it. Yeah. I just do not want that responsibility. Like I managing the funds of Nightworms, Ashley really, she was a a banker. She knows numbers like her and I are so complimentary in that issue where I, I have like, a lot of knowledge in this area, but she has a lot of knowledge in the numbers. Like I just, I, it's just an, a business situation that I feel like some publishers do really well and some just really don't. And I just would never want to be the not, you know, Yeah. never want to get in that myself in that position. I get it. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do, you know, I've edited a few um, like anthologies and, but I wouldn't want to have, this be my thing and and me be solely responsible for it. Um, Yeah. And I do love the business of publishing. Like I like being, um, being able to curate talent. Like I feel like there's a lot of untapped talent and I want to be able to have that voice. I want to be able to make mm -hmm. those decisions. Um, So thankfully I know a lot of people in the publishing industry that, that allow me to edit or to do this novella series like I'm doing with cemetery gates. Like that is really cool, but that's mm-hmm. as close as I want to come to like yeah, publishing myself. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. The financials of it always made me nervous. I'd kicked yeah. around the idea of opening a press for a while. Just having to send people royalty checks and calculating all that. And I was oh. like, Oh my God. Oh, you know, no. I, I have, um, when uh, I put when John and I put our book out behind a barn, um, I I have a friend Duncan Ralston. You've probably seen his book Womb and some other books of his around. Yeah, but uh, he's a friend of mine, and he has like a kind of like the same thing that a lot of us do. Like I have static static age books where it's like you're never going to see a, another book that doesn't you know if it doesn't say Chad Let's Gonna, it's not going to have static static age books because that's just my thing, and it's you know yeah. it's like. It's just me self-publishing, and a lot of people have that. And instead of doing that um, early on when we did All Behind the Barn, we Duncan was like, "Hey, if you want to slap my, you know, self-pub thing on the back, other people are using it. Like I think Glenn Rolfe and some other people that I know." So I was like, "You know, what the heck? I'll do that." And he formatted it for us. And you know, I'm the one who uploaded. It's not like he gets anything. It just happens to have that logo on the back of it. Sure. It? And then he would post it on on his website. But um, Static Age Books doesn't have a thing like that. But I've told John um, in like working with Tim and and some other authors, I'm like, I did I did this self pub this thing with John because John is he doesn't I mean I pay I pay him every month royalties. Sometimes I'll skip a month, but he's not used to getting paid uh, anyway. <laughs> by uh, (laughs) at least not timely by publishers right the worst luck with with that stuff and so he doesn't care but i don't want to be respond i don't i'm it's like it's okay out behind the barn i can do the math on this one book and send out at the beginning of every month yeah you know your money and then you know the screenshots of all the stuff you know whatever that i need to do but i don't want to have a catalog of stuff where i've got to send out more like if when john and i do another book 
we'll probably self-publish. But if yeah. Tim and I do another book, we're going to find a publisher because I don't want that's one more person is one more too many that work. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting because um, being in the position that I'm in, Ashley and I work with a lot of publishers on the business end of things, buying and selling and acquiring these books for the package. And then on the other end, I also have like a really great relationship with a lot of authors. So it's interesting that I hear the business end of the publishers and I hear the complaints from the authors about things. And it really informs a lot of my decisions about the publishing industry and like mm -hmm. who's doing what right. You know, like when I approached Cemetery Gates with my idea for a no novella series, it had been a long time, like maybe two years of me hearing that Cemetery Gates pays their authors really timely. They're really on top of things. They're really on the ball. They have a good business sense because I just don't want to tie myself and my name to something and then have that thing go up in smoke because it's happened so many times. It, it will continue to happen. Yeah. But in, yeah. It's sad. sometimes it's, it's out of their control and sometimes yeah. they just yeah. never should have started in the first place. Yeah. No, it's really disappointing and sad. And, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's something that you have to always be like keeping your fingers on um, to just, to just know like who's legit who's just a hobbyist, who isn't paying people, like, you know, just having your ear to the ground. Yeah. And, and such a small genre like horror, too. There are yeah. so many people who just do these fly-by-night operations uh, that you know a year from now they're going to be out of business. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can vouch for Cemetery Gates because I think I've worked with them three or four times. I think I'm in four of their anthologies. And, yeah, I've never been paid that fast ever for a story. Yeah, there's not even a, I don't I don't think I've ever even signed a contract with them. It's just like I send in the story, and I think they've all been invite invites. Send in the story, and that same day I get paid. That's so yeah. cool. I That's I've crazy. heard that more than once. Yeah, and they pay well. Yeah. So um, yeah, what's the only thing I don't like is I don't know who these people are, and I've always known. You know, it's just it's like their first name is Cemetery, and their last name is Gates. <laughs> I don't know who these people are, so I can't like really put a face. To yeah, them. yeah. Feels, uh, I like to have the intimate co connection. Have you like, ever Googled? I know what Joe looks like. No, but I, I guess because I've always had a um, like Crystal Lake Publishing, Joe Meinhardt. You know, he doesn't have a huge media presence as far as like doing a lot of interviews and things like that. He's done a couple, but um, I know Joe. You know, and I and I talk to him and stuff at Cemetery Gates. Mina, it's like I don't even know who I'm talking to, but thank you <laughs> for inviting me and thank you for paying me. Probably. Well, the next time I do a little Zoom call with him on like a business thing, I'll just sneak my phone up and take a little screenshot and show it to you. Okay. <laughs> I know what he looks like. <laughs> Speaking of being involved with different publishers, who all do you review for now? Oh, okay. So I review for Cemetery Dance Online. Mm -hmm. And Scream Magazine in the UK, which is a, the my print um, publication. And I also review for Room Morgue when they have need. I'll just review something and ask them if they want it. And then, you know, they either accept it or they don't, depending on the room. Um, Mystery and Suspense Magazine. Um not really reviews for Lit Reactor, although I can, but I mostly do like articles and listicles for them, uh, book recommendations. Um, and Tour Nightfire, which Tour Nightfire, now that they're starting to pump up the volume on their publishing end and all their releases are coming out this year, I doubt the blog is going to be as updated. So I haven't written any content for them for a while. Um, but also the lineup, which is um, another like kind of listicle type of thing um but mostly reviews for cemetery dance and scream are my two major ones yeah that's great that's yeah. a lot more than i expected you to list <laughs> yeah i always am adding i just think it's um fun to have a lot of bylines and a lot of avenues to shop a review so that i just don't have to like feed them to goodreads um i'd, I'd rather like amplify uh, those. Sure. Yeah. Do you do your horror entrepreneurial side? Is this full time for you or do you have another job that, and you do this on the side? 
Yeah, this what this is my full time job, um, and it and That's it amazing. was uh, starting, I think, in the fall of 2019. I quit my my uh, job. Um, it was just like a part time job, but I was working in a in a daycare, a preschool for the museum here, the the big like children's museum in in my city. Um, so I was like singing songs with kids and. In the meantime, I had my Shopify app on like pre-order day, like making the cha-ching sound. And my coworker was like, I think you're going to quit your job pretty soon. And I was like, that would be, that's the goal. That's what I want to do. So yeah, I quit in 2019. <clears throat> that's amazing. Do, do you yeah. use the reviews to funnel people to Nightworms at all? Is there a crossover or just your whole online presence kind of is a funnel? Yeah, I feel like it's just like... um like kind of the Sadie Hartman mother horror brand by itself. And then everything kind of sometimes funnels over to nightworms, but I keep the reviews totally separate from that. I never mention nightworms in any of my reviews. Um, and sometimes like a, a platform will put that I'm the owner. Like if they have a bio, it'll, I'll, it'll say, but generally I don't mention it anywhere. And, and I've just become really recently active on Reddit which they don't really want a lot of like self promotion. Um, so I just, I just enjoy promoting horror in general. Um, and then nightworms just kind of like happens when people start looking at me, you know? Sure. Yeah. It's just interesting that you've managed to do a full-time job because most of this podcast is about trying to get authors, horror authors to be able to do it full-time and you don't even write, fiction you just are in the sphere of it and you're able to have a full-time job that's just incredible thank you i it was it's a big goal of mine to be able to to sustain my my family and myself like having a career doing this um and when i applied for the horror writers association they really didn't have a category for nonfiction writers because i just don't think that a lot of platforms are paying enough for people just freelance nonfiction writing uh, reviews and stuff can make a living doing that. So they just didn't have a pathway for my membership. Um, but they worked with me really closely and I showed them like all my receipts and just all my statements and stuff. And eventually the pathway opened and now there are other uh, freelance writers, nonfiction writers getting their horror writers association membership. Oh, so you kind of blazed the path on that. A little bit. Yeah, it was a little funky there for a while. Like, because I have so many streaming revenues, um, you know, usually an author is just showing like whatever statements from their books, but I have like a lot of income coming in from different what angles. So yeah, they were really cool about it. Nice. What have you learned doing Nightworms, both the, as as the review team and, and just the the subscription package that you feel you wouldn't have learned without it. Hmm. I think I learned a, to have a lot more respect for authors. I mean, I feel like I went into reviewing, respecting authors, like books have always been my escape. Books have always been there for me. Like they are my friends. They are, you know, fictional people I carry around with me in my heart all the time. Um, I just love reading and I love authors for telling their stories, but I didn't really know like how much work and how much time and how much like of themselves they're putting into this process of writing and putting out a story. And so I, I get so protective of, authors like it's really hard for me to stay out of the dialogue that goes on on social media about the battle between reviewers and authors um or just like reviews that trash the author or trash a book like I don't feel like my job as a reviewer in any way shape or form is to dissuade anyone from reading the book like my job is just to talk about my reading experience and then let people make a decision on whether or not that book is for them based on my experience. Not like this is a horrible book and nobody should read it. Like I could never in a million years imagine saying anything like that ever, unless the book was like, you know, promoting some kind of horrible message <laughs> that, but I just haven't run across that. So that's great that you have that perspective because usually people, and this goes for any, any kind of creative outlet, 
people, unless they've done it themselves or they have that creative mindset, they don't have that perspective and they have no problem saying, um, yeah, that this, even to the point where it sounds vindictive, you know, like a review, whether it be a movie or an album or something. Now, granted, there are some people like Stephen King who it, it almost feels like it's okay to say his new book sucked, you know, mm-hmm. where I'm, I'm okay with saying that. And I love Stephen King. Mm-hmm. I'm not okay with saying that so and so's book sucked when I know he's an indie author. And it's just, a, it's, it's just different. But I'm yeah. glad that you have that perspective. Yeah, because um, it reminds me of like, I have some friends or, or just whoever, if, if, if I do a new painting or something and somebody looks at it and they're just like staring at it, you know, and they're looking and they're like, wow, I can tell either they have gained that perspective um, with a creative mind or they themselves are an artist. And then I have friends that are like, yeah, that's cool. Like it just, mm-hmm. and they have like this, I envision them as kind of having this mindset that creative things are born and they're not yeah. created. Like, yeah. are, like ours, you know, wasn't put into this painting or this movie or this or book or painting or whatever. And that it's just kind of like, uh, I have a lot of friends that, that they're just like, and I love them, but you can tell they're, they're just not there. And when they look at something like a painting, they're just like, yeah, cool. It's like all, it's like really taken for granted. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> or they just don't have like they've either not spent any time creatively making something yeah. or they don't know anybody who has like I have a son who spends up to like five six hours on one piece of art and I I post his art sometimes on Twitter You're just because time, I'm yeah. a big proud mom but just to see the amount of effort and time and energy he puts into one piece. And then if he were to put it out on social media and someone to like be a total dick to him, I would punch that person in the fucking teeth. Like don't do that. You know, don't do that to people. Like there's a way to be critical of art. It's so subjective anyway. So like whatever you don't like, someone else is going to love, but why would you like go the extra mile to actually be like, hurtful about it that doesn't make any sense to me stephen king retweeted your son's artwork did he 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 did yeah last year that's awesome yeah that had to feel pretty cool for him (laughs) did did it make him really nervous when that happened yeah he didn't really know how to feel about it and i think it was paul tremblay or gabino i can't really remember but somebody messaged me and was like do you even know what kind of a gift that is that he just gave your son? Because he can use that on like any kind of a blurb or whatever he wants. Like, you know, Paul Tremblay uses Stephen King's tweet on the covers of his books, you know, I'd have that tattooed on my forehead. If I was Tremblay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said, this is excellent or something. <laughs> That's amazing. I, yeah. I yeah. can't even imagine that. How old is your son? 16. Yeah. I'd have lost my mind. <laughs> I know. I know. That's incredible. Um, I have a a, a strange kind of like a a reader reviewer question Um, asking you for um, advice for writers. Like what's the most important thing for you when you are like thoroughly enjoying a book? And um, yeah, we'll we'll stick with that for now. Like what's the most important thing for you when, when, that really gets you thoroughly enjoying a book. I will say just like food, I eat with my eyes first. And if the book cover sucks, I probably won't read it. So like nine times out of 10, when an author asks me if I will review or read their book, if the cover is gross, I I just, I, I, I know myself. I'm not going to bad art. Yeah. I just don't like it. I, I don't, it spend the money on a good, a good book cover. Even if I don't like the art, if I can tell that it's quality, how about that? Um, but then what gets me up in the morning for, for a book It's I, I come to the table expecting to fall in love. Like I want to open that book. I want to read characters that I can invest in and, and call those people like, fictional friends for the duration of the book. I want to love them. I want to care about them. And especially in horror, if the risks are high, the 
more affected I'm going to be, the harder I'm going to fall, the worse I'm going to feel. Like I want to be destroyed. I want to feel the gut punches. I want to feel like I can't handle my life. I want to cry. I just want to get into that book and just feel something. Um, And so when I'm reading something and the characters are just kind of cardboard cutouts that are just, you know, fuel for whatever gross thing is happening to them. I'm not going to show up for that. That doesn't, that doesn't float my boat. Like I, I'm not, I might have fun or I might be entertained, but those aren't the books I'm going to put on my bookshelf and buy 10 editions of them with all different covers in all the languages. Like Mm -hmm. that's not going to do it for me, but I'll read them and have fun, but that's not my favorite. Right. Yeah. Characters. I want, I want characters that, um, yeah, that feel real to me and that are going through some real bullshit. Like I think in 2020, I read the most books I've ever read in my life. It was like, I broke 200 and I Jeez. read, yeah, I read in the month of March. I read like, I think it was like 15 or 18 books, two books in one day. And I know it was just because we were going through the pandemic crisis and I, I just like had to get away. I had to like get into something. I read Richard Matheson's hell house in one day and broke my eyeballs and had to go get glasses. (laughs) 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 Never wore glasses before. You know, I actually read that book very quickly too. When I got into it, I adored that book. Yeah, Yeah. I did too. I think I was reading it on a train and I, I got to where I was going and I just had to sit there and keep reading it before I went to visit my, my brother. Yeah, Yeah. That's a good book. I love that. I love that. And again, really interesting characters. And I wanted to know what was going to happen to them. The risk was really important. Yeah. I I enjoyed it too. Yeah. That's a good one. So not just for you personally in, in kind of in that same vein, uh, not just for you personally, but um, having an eye on other readers, because you, you associate with so many other readers and reviewers and, and pay attention to what they like. What do you think makes for an all around bad read? Other than the obvious, like, bad grammar and just... Yeah. I don't really, because I am such, like, an emotional reader, I really don't see, like, grammar and and typos and stuff unless there's a lot, you know? And then I'll be like, whoa, what is this? (laughs) What happened to this book? Um, So it really takes a lot for that to be an issue for me. Um, I think when there's too much going on in a book, like, an author maybe has, like, a bunch of ideas they're trying to squeeze into one novel and nothing is really executed fully. Everything's just kind of crammed in. I've read a couple books like that in the last um, months and I was just, it made for a very muddy, confusing experience. I would rather just have like one trope or two tropes kind of like mingled together Um too much mashup of genres can be really frustrating for me. Um, too much supernatural elements coming into like a human horror um, can make for a bad read for me. Um, anything that's just kind of overly offensive just for the sake of being shocking mm-hmm. will make me quit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, like, have been really spoiled by short chapters lately. <laughs> so, if chapters go on for a really long time, that could be a bummer for me, and I'll end up, I'll end up trying to pick up something else. I want a place to put my bookmark at the end of the night, you know? Yeah, or at least like a sub chapter, like the ask. Yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. No, yeah. I'm the same way about that. The shorter the, ch- I think James Patterson's the one who broke me on that. Now, if there's a super long chapter, I'm like, guys, give me a a pause point here. (laughs) Yes. Totally spoiled me. Plus I like the hooks. If they're really good at it and they can put a a hook at the end of each chapter, it actually makes me read longer. Oh crap. I'll read another two pages. And then there's another hook and I'm like, damn it. I know. I love that. It's my favorite. Chuck Wendig does that so well in his Miriam black series. I just binged the hell out of all of those books. There's like seven of them. And I was just like more, more, more. That's a formula that I that I always try to do, um, is to you know end a chapter on that note where it's uh, uh, intriguing or just 
when when you kind of like a good edit in a in a film yeah and um and then where it's just because it was edited quickly and stopped right there it gives you a moment to think and consider what just happened almost like it was cut off prematurely and so i i try to do that and uh i definitely do the short chapter thing there's some psychology behind all that um and yeah I, it's I it's good stuff that. Yeah, short, short, short chapters and and novella length. Like I think the sweet spot for novels is like right around three. Um, I love books that are like three hundred, tipping into like three fifty. Mm-hmm. But if like something four to seven hundred pages shows up, I'm always kind of like, when am I going to fit that in? Like, you know, those are those are hard. Speaking of, uh, I'm glad you brought up novellas because. Um... I'm sure you've seen like all of these places are now having open call for novellas and the novella has been slowly getting a little bit more popular. And I think this year, just right at the right from the beginning of the year, um, it's uh, it seems like it's really starting to kind of peak with that, you know, with all these open calls and stuff. And um, do you see more? I mean, I think I've seen like three publishers do open calls just starting in, you know, at least in making the announcement in January, do you see the novella taking off more? And if so, do you see, because um, trad publishers seem to kind of be a step behind uh, everybody else in a lot of what they do, do you, do you see them finally maybe, and even agents accepting uh, shorter books, something that's not 70K? So, yeah, I, I don't know if I formulated my question very well, but do you see? No, I get it. (laughs) Yeah. Like tour.com is the hero of the novella tour publishes a lot of novellas, like flowers of the sea came out last year. Um, And then tour Nightfire had nothing but blackened teeth and put a hardcover on that too. I was like, "Mm, yeah. Um, And I think the cool thing about novellas is it's a great format for horror. Um, And the short story too, is I just think like, it's hard to keep that tension going for the length of a novel. I mean, you have like stops and starts with that horror and that vibe that that readers get to be junkies for. But a novella, you can ride that horror vibe for all, like the duration. Mm-hmm. And it's awesome like to just get into something that just is tight and concise and has like a really good story in a short amount of time. And I, that's why I did that novella call with Cemetery Gates. It's like, I want that, like that to, to be able to finish and like start and finish something in one sitting is very rewarding. I think for readers, especially in this day and age when we have so many things competing for our attention um, to just get in and get it on is, is a good thing. But tour.com really is like, they're doing that. And, and indie Indies are are able to do that, I should say. I did sub to them uh, 216 days ago today. I subbed uh, oh, wow. to, yeah. to Nightfire. And uh, I guess we've got until, what, March or something? In nine months, up to nine months. So I don't know. We'll see. But Yeah, I mean, you never know. It's nice to see uh, a bigger publisher um, putting out because the ones that they put out, they put out the, the Needless Street one too, right? Needless Street was a novel, though. It was a little bit bigger. Yeah, it was a little bit bigger. Um, But remember, like, Gillian Flynn had The Grown Up, which was a very slim novel, or it's like a novella size. And I remember everybody being like, oh, what? I'm not going to pay, like, $16, $18 for a hardcover novella. You know, but that was five years ago. And I think that the tune has totally changed. Yeah. Yeah, I think novellas were really big when I first started writing about 10 years ago because of Kindles. Uh, And then when they changed Kindle Unlimited's pay structure, I think is when authors moved away from it very quickly because you couldn't make as much money. Mm. And I think that's what kind of caused the delay in the adoption of novellas. Because on a Kindle, you can pay two, three bucks for a story and just crush it. I, I, I feel like they should be bigger than they are, particularly in horror. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely should. Like, um, domain publishing has those sharp, short, sharp shocks. Um, and I, I binge maybe 20 of those. They're 99 cents each. Just pop them on your Kindle. You read like Ross Jeffrey has like a 
a set of three stories on one of those. Um, and I just read the whole thing. Like you just, and there, and it's good. I, all of them were good. I didn't read one bad story and I just flew through them. Um, and it's just a lot of fun and it's better than an anthology or a collection because an anthology takes time to go through like, and it's, and it's, it's almost the equivalent of like, if you're in a novel, even a good one, you're driving like a sports car and you're just chilling and you're just going for like two hours down the road. You don't have to make any stops. It, it's driving itself. You know, you're in a nice sports car, but I feel like an anthology or a collection sometimes can feel like you're in a bus making a lot of stops because you have to like stop. Everybody gets off, you get back on, you get going again. And it's the same ride. Um, for 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 like an anthology because you have to stop and start and get into it and get out of it and get into it and start again and yeah. you know that's a lot of starts and finishes in one thing and I know a lot of readers get burnt out on those so the novella is like it's not a short story but it's not a novel it's just like a little sweet spot yeah I agree yeah. Chad do you have anything else before we start wrapping this up um no, I was just going to give Sadie the opportunity to give us an exclusive if if she has one. Like, uh, I mean, I know kind of some things that you're doing, but can is there anything that you can like publicly say that that maybe you haven't or that you were on the verge of talking about this? Keep in mind, this won't air for what, like late February, mid to late February, something like that. Yeah, this is our fourth. We just put and we're doing it biweekly. So, and we just put our our first one out. So yeah, this will be a while. Okay. Yeah. I will actually say, because I think by the time this comes out, I will probably have already talked about it a few times. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I did just take a job with um, Pandy Press, which is the publishing house that Joe Lansdale and his daughter Casey started to be able to collect all of Joe's backlist titles um, so they've been doing that, but they haven't really promoted it in, in any big fashion or splashy way. Um, but they are going to really soon. So they hired me as like a band brand ambassador slash social media, um, personality for them. Um, and we've been having like business meetings and stuff and they're going to be publishing, publishing other, uh, authors and stuff besides just Joe's, uh, work. Awesome. So that's exciting, man. I'm Congrats. really excited about that. Yeah. To be I'm, working with the Lansdales. I'm definitely going to have my eye open for any kind of, you know, down the road. If he does have any kind of like, I don't know, open call or maybe he's going to handpick stuff. I, who knows, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, the sky's the limit really. I mean, Casey, um, Casey has a really good eye for talent and, and um, you know, with, with all of Joe's backlist being there, um, I think that that that's kind of like the bread and butter, but it's not a vanity press. So she really wants to be able to like get into some other Westerns and some adventure books and some horror. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're going to be killing it. That's Have cute. you stepped back to kind of see how your, what your position has become in the horror community? I, you're talking about Stephen King retweeting you and, Joe Lansdale's hiring you. Have you like, sat back and just reflected on what the hell is happening here? No, <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't. Like I have like moments where I'll screen capture something and send it to my parents. And, and my dad will be like, what, what the, he kind of does like the whole thing for me where he's just like, Sadie, Oh my God, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. You know? And then I kind of get all excited and like, Oh wow. Yeah. But then on like the daily hustle, I kind of just have my head down, like doing all the work. So I don't really stop and, that's, and reflect. That's, good, no, that's the best way to do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I should it can slow you down. If you think about all that stuff, man, I mean, it, yeah, there's been times where I got like a blurb or something. Um, especially the ones I didn't ask for like Chismar or Ketchum. Didn't yeah. Ask for any blurb. And it's like somebody points me to Twitter or something. And I'm like, what? Yeah. And I'm just like, I can't think I can't write now. And I'm just kind of floating on this cloud. And yeah. I think too, I would start to doubt myself. Like yeah, I get in my head too much. Yeah. You yeah. know, 
Imposter syndrome can get imposter very real. syndrome. I don't want none of that shit. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to think about it too long. Yeah. All right. Two more questions we ask everybody and we'll let you go. Okay. The first is in growing your, how about we call it horrorpreneur? Uh, we'll go with that. In growing your business, what is the one thing you've done that has brought you the best results? Oh, uh, it's kind of twofold, but it it really is just um, building relationships, I will say, is really important. It's the social part of social media that nobody likes to do. But if you're, you're good at encouraging others and talking to others and building other people up, like, and not in a fake way, because holy shit, I can smell that for a mile, a mile away, but just really be intentional about um, building relationships and engagement, the social part of social media, um, it, I think is the the number one thing, like, just, just be cool to people, like, be kind and, and treat people how you would want to be treated when, when you release something really exciting, like, congratulate that person like genuinely and be like, good for you. That's awesome. So that when you release something and you're excited about it, you know, people are going to be like, Hey, good job. Like you did, you know, give what you want to get is really important. I think people who are cold or standoffish on social media always wonder like, why am I not, you know, I put out something really cool and nobody talks to me. Nobody cares. It's like, well, do you care about anybody? Like, I don't know. You're not going to get much out of it if you don't give. It's very yeah. true. Yeah. Now, what one thing have you done that you were like, wow, that was a complete waste of time and I wish I had not? Fucking TikTok is a waste of time. You were carrying the flag for a minute. I was. I was like, get on TikTok because it has the opportunity to go viral like, and you have no idea if or when it will. Um, and I had a few videos go really viral and it was really fun to see a bunch of followers come in um, really quickly, but there's no way to tell what is going to do well. And you will spin your wheels making a hundred videos and it won't do anything. And the learning curve is really hard as a 45 year old person. I do not understand what the hell is going on over there. Honestly, like <laughs> why are we mouthing like sentences from videos? I don't even know. Like, I don't understand what the hell is going on over there. So TikTok was a waste of time for me. It's like uh it's like two thirds twerking, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the old songs, like my son will be driving around the car with me and like some Steve Miller band song will come over on the radio and my son will be like, Oh, that's a TikTok song. I'm like, what? Are you, <laughs> what? No, this is yeah. old. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, no, they use it now. Like, you know, in this like 30 second bite, everybody's mouth you know, mouthing the lyrics to it. I'm like, wow. Okay. I don't mm. get it. <laughs> okay. Stay off TikTok. Got yeah. it. <laughs> uh, if you can find your thing over there, good for you. But I did not find it. If someone wants to get a hold of you and spam you with the, their request, read my book and Please no. subscribe to Nightworms or anything, how can they get a hold of you? everywhere pretty much like you can find me on twitter as mother horror or sadie hartman you can find me on instagram as mother horror i am on nightworms um the website and the twitter and the social media for that i hate facebook so i'm not on facebook don't message me on facebook i hate it <laughs> no, I'll, I'll post all the links in the show notes in uh, the description on youtube too so people can just click on it great yeah that's awesome just say hi to me like i'm i'm very accessible well, don't go anywhere. Um, we're, we'll sign off and then we'll sign off again. But I just want to thank you for coming on here and hanging out with us. And Yeah, and thanks for having me, you guys. Hanging out with you and talking. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Yeah, it was really great to meet you too, Jason.